Hello, 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 and welcome to episode number five of Fast Casual, Lando's official podcast brought to you live today, Wednesday, July 19, from both San Francisco and New York this time. Uh, my name is Alex Mann, and I am your host again today. Remember that every restaurant has a story, so without further delay, let's get this show on the road. I'm delighted to say we have our CEO, Vivian Wang, here today. Say hi, Vivian. Hi, everyone. Um, who'll be chatting with none other than hospitality industry legend Stephen Mancini. <laughs> it's a beautiful uh, legend firm where you have to ask some people, but yeah, nice to be here, happy to be here. So, thanks for having me. All right, great stuff, great stuff. Uh, well, Vivian, we'll start with you. Just give us a little quick little intro about yourself again. Yeah, I'm the CEO and founder of Landed. We help restaurants with hiring, hourly team members up to managers. So, excited to be having a conversation today with Stephen because. You know, there's a lot of different moving parts of the restaurant space, and there have been a lot of interesting changes to the economic environment uh, that's going to impact how restaurants think about planning for their businesses. So Stephen is an expert in the space. I'm very excited for today's combo. Sweet. And uh, Steve, yourself, do you want to give us a little quick intro to who you are? Quick, long, however yeah. you want it to be, really. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. So Stephen Mancini, uh, I'm a director at Cone Resnick. Uh, we're a professional services firm, kind of your traditional tax audit uh, and advisory firm. I run the hospitality industry for our global consulting solutions practice. So um, do a lot of work with hospitality operators, no matter kind of whether it's fine dining or fast casual um, or quick serve at that. So do a lot of work in this space. I guess my background, 25 years of operational experience. So I guess that gives me a little bit of chops on how to advise clients because I've I've locked up the restaurant at, you know, two o'clock in the morning and I've also kind of, you know, bust the dishes from tables. So kind of get the ins and outs of things. So uh, happy to be here and kind of talk about different topics. Great stuff. Great stuff. Um, I remember when we were chatting a couple of weeks ago, you actually uh, quoted yourself as a soup to nuts bus boy to VC. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which... I mean, you know what? I probably have a couple of gray hairs from that experience. That's for sure. Um, oh, but yeah, so started as a bus boy and kind of ran through to run my own group and kind of sold to a venture capital firm. So kind of seen the whole life cycle all the way through from uh, the impetus of opening restaurants to kind of the exit from uh, a restaurant group. So yeah, for sure. Awesome. And I mean, uh, the last time we spoke, you know, a couple of weeks ago, which I was, I was laughing at you just there, it feels like a lifetime ago now, pre-July 4, uh, you were telling me like, like that you basically like see everything in your role now. Yeah. Um, and that like, you know, from IPOs to, you know, full service to CPG sort of pivots, your know, digital transformations, information empowerment, analytics, it seems like you run the gamut there across like everything within sort of like the restaurant hospitality space. And I mean, I suppose no better place to start than there, you know, if we kind of think about like your sort of like savant, like seeing around corners and uh, preparing, uh, you know, for like the inflection points in businesses, I suppose in that, in that sense, like, you know, how important does that play like in your role and like, you know, how do like restaurants even like prepare for even to even think in that sort of mindset? I mean, it seems like such an elevated mindset. Yeah, no, uh, appreciate that. And um, it's, yeah, it's interesting. I do see the entire gauntlet, right? See the whole uh, soup to nuts, all different facets and aspects of the hospitality industry, right? All, all segments um, in my role. And, and I'd say that regardless of segment, whether fast, casual, fine dining or other, there's always kind of some key performance indicators, right? Those metrics, those operational metrics that kind of make you, um, right, successful or not successful. So, whether it's fine dining or whether it's, you know, fast casual, cost of goods sold is always important, right? Labor turnover, always important. Um, whether you're becoming, uh, going IPO and going public or not, or if you're a privately held organization, right? Investors still want to see their return on investment. So ult ultimately, you know, regardless of what segment of the hospitality industry, right? Really all businesses operate kind of trying to achieve certain goals. And a lot of those goals are, are similar. So, you know, what, what I do, you know, from a career perspective, you know, I really help organizations try to hit those goals, right? Try to hit those operational metrics, performance metrics, revenue metrics, um, and really understanding the business models and understanding how businesses work, you know, allows you to, you know, pull the, nev the level, level and, you know, uh, kind of dial in in certain areas to try to hit those goals. So um, part of what we do is not only solve for today, but also try to solve for the future. And, you know, I guess that's the term seeing around corners. Right. right? Um, I So, you know, the some of the latest like June data has come out, right? And it's looking like that same store sales for casual dining has been improving. It's been traditionally this um, segment that like in the past six, six to 12 months has been 
a little bit more challenged than say QSR. So with same store sales rising like nearly 4% last month, um, despite a traffic decline, I think one of the trends that we're seeing in the industry is that um, a lot of restaurants are thinking about how to get like that, like big spender or like the higher spenders as traffic rather than necessarily trying to address the entire customer base. Um, another kind of fun thing that I saw was that, uh, you know, obviously gas prices has have dropped. I'm not personally a driver, but I know that a lot of our uh, clients like uh, are based in like suburbs and rural and even just like, you know, cities where driving is more common than New York. Right. Um, but like, you know, a nearly like 20, like a 20% drop in the average gas prices has definitely boosted consumer spending. So that could kind of feed into why same store sales have been increasing. But like, you know, how are you thinking about that? Right? Like, you know, when you think about benchmarks, like 4% same store sales increase in one month, is that good? Like, you know, what, how should operators be thinking about how they're benchmarking against their peers? Yeah, no, I think it's a it's an interesting point and great data that you've kind of brought into the conversation. I'm appreciative of that. Um, you know, I think, you know, the way that I look at it is I think revenue is only one component. Right. Um, ultimately, growing the top line is, is perfectly fine. But if you can't grow the bottom line in correlation, right, then, you know, whether same store sales are up or not are kind of insignificant. Right. So from a benchmarking perspective, I think there's obviously macro factors that influence different businesses and different you know, sectors, right, different industries and things like uh, commodity pricing, things like uh, gas pricing all have those impacts. But, you know, if you're baking those additional costs, right, if macro trends are increasing those commodity costs into your pricing metrics, right, then ultimately you're going to kind of get that increase in revenue. And I think where the real trick is, is saying, hey, can I bake in the price? If I can't bake in the price, you know, how do I operate in a certain in a certain manner in order to ensure that, right, if those 4% is going to the top line, then I'm also bringing it down to the bottom line. So I think benchmarking against peers is important from a revenue perspective, but I think even more important is from an operational perspective, because that's really what drives that bottom line. Got it. Yes, absolutely. Like, yeah, bottom line is, uh, so we hear it a lot, actually. And it's funny, because we work with a bunch of franchisees across different brands. And right. even within the same brand, despite having the exact same food, you know, obviously, you're in different geographies, but similar type of demographics of geographies, like certain stores just perform outperform like orders of magnitude some others. Right. And um, it can come down to like how you're running the operations, like where do you typically find is the most opportunity um, for improving that bottom line, like for helping improve the business health, if you go into a restaurant, or like say a portfolio of locations, and you see the ones that are struggling, like typically, like what are the top three areas that, or maybe just top one area that's causing that like 911 status? Uh, should I say labor? Is that, is that? <laughs> no, I mean, it could be, I mean, labor is probably one of the top three. Right, for sure. what, what are the, I mean, labor is <laughs> always the top three, if not the top one, right. but like, what are the ones that you're like typically finding as like the biggest like challenge? Cause I you know we have a lot of operators who, usually watch this during and after. And sometimes it just feels like you're like, where do I even start? Yeah, you know, it's a great, great conversation point, right? So labor, obviously a, a huge driver of revenue, right? What your turnover is at a location, there's inherent costs about onboarding and offboarding personnel, right? Getting people trained up and staffed accordingly, right? And then kind of with labor rates going up, minimum wage going up for tipped employees in a lot of locations, um, it's become a, a huge driver of costs for, for hospitality operators, more so than it has been in the past, right? Those traditional other areas that people would look at, right, is cost of goods sold, obviously, right? So you're looking at, you know, how much does it cost you to sell, right, a, a product, whether that's food, beverage, alcoholic, non-alcoholic, et cetera. Um, and I feel like those are areas that people often look at. I would say that there's often oversight as it relates to variable costs within an operating model. Um, very quick anecdote. Uh, did a, uh, a project for an international fast casual concept that wasn't really having the impact in the U.S. market as they thought they were going to have. Right. They were kind of based out of England and had representation you know, throughout the throughout the world. Right. In, in, uh, in the Middle East and other areas. And one of the things was that they weren't driving to the bottom line margins that they were looking to drive from a private equity perspective, right? Because as much as when I was an operator, there was the, the glory and the James Beard nomination and all that kind of stuff. 
bottom line is the bottom line, right? Yeah. Nobody really cares, right? That you get written up here or there when, if you're not making the cash. So um, the, the concept was fast casual, it was Asian concept, right? So the kind of Asian fusion cuisine. And one of the things that I noticed just being on site is they had these, um, these placemats, right? That they were printing for each, you know, each turn, right? So they put a, a paper placemat in front of somebody, right? They ordered their food, they got the food, right? Turn, take the placemat, throw it out, throw another one down. There was like eight or nine colors that were printed on that placemat. And it was also printed on both sides, right? And it was saying, cool, if you're doing a thousand covers a week or 10,000 covers a week, that means you need 10,000 placemats. Is there a cheaper way to print these out and still deliver the same value, right? Is it a one, is it a one color? Is it a two color? Is it just one side, not two sides, right? Those kind of very, yeah. those variable costs there. And what we talk about is the total cost of experience, yeah. not just the food itself or the beverage itself, but the cost of the experience from an operational perspective. So things like placemats, things like doormats, things like, you know, how you stock your bar, who you stock your bar with, what team members are doing that. Think about your operations holistically and the cost that it is to mm -hmm. open the door and lock the door and kind of what those costs are in between outside of food and labor. So a lot of variable costs yeah. in there that can be cut. Um, you know, it's so funny. I, um, I've heard about this through some operators. You know, there are some operators who are literally like counting the ketchup packets. <laughs> like when people like throw away the whole ketchup or mustard packets, it's like yeah. every single one of those is like three cents. And yeah, you, you can see trends like even like places like Chipotle. I haven't been in a while, but, you know, you see dispensing or, you know, I was in Shake Shack a couple of weeks ago. They dispense ketchup as opposed to the packets of ketchup. Yep. Right. So, you know, from a from a cost perspective, it's maybe one of those things that always has to go with uh, with the product that they sell because everybody kind of assumes it with their yeah. cuisine. But the cheaper that they can do that day in and day out and kind of find synergies across their organization to be able to, you know, to to, I guess, offer guests the ketchup in that manner, you know, it might seem like a little bit crazy, I guess, to talk about <laughs> ketchup packets, but really when you're, when you're turning out as much product as they do, right. Or other organizations do, you know, those, you know, five cents or let's call it 150 bucks at the end of the week really adds up over time. And if you can kind of grab that amongst 10 different categories, right. Then you're actually saving some money at the end of the year. Yeah, no, absolutely. That makes a ton of sense. I mean, it's, ketchup packets, these pa like, and it's now I'm so cognizant of it. Like when I go, when I order food, I'm right. like, how many ketchup packets do they put in my oh. order, like order in my hamburger? Order? When I dine out with my wife, she makes me uh, face the corner of the room, not looking out. She makes me like look at the corner where she can kind of look out because she's <laughs> saying, I can't have you looking out because you're not going to pay attention to anything that I say. Yes, <laughs> yes. Kind of wanders and, and, and watches. So yeah, I totally get that. It's kind of one of those things for sure. Yeah. Are you um are you saying as well that like, you know, that anecdote is more broadly symptomatic of like a bigger sort of issue with any type of business that you look into that if you saw like the place mats as or the dinner mats as a uh, like almost like a red flag that you would see that and you go, okay, I would assume that there are other things within this business that are slightly kind of that you would have a more elevated risk assumption than say if you walked in into like say an alternative business, for example? Uh, I, I don't know if there's a direct correlation there. I think maybe more what I'm driving towards is, you know, labor cost, food cost, beverage cost is always what everybody looks at, right? Yeah. Those are kind of those main categories. And there's only so much squeeze you can get out of them without compromising your product, whether that's from a customer satisfaction perspective or whether that's from a just, you know, a, a taste perspective of food, right? There's also a lot of other fat in your P&L from an operational perspective. And I think sometimes it's a really good exercise to look at some of those other operational costs that are variable, right? We're not talking about rent because that's kind of a, a tough nut to crack or to, to move, but there sure. are other categories that you can maybe get a 1% or get a 3%, right? And if you can do that against 10, then you're, you know, you're not changing the quality of what you're doing. You're still going to market with a great kind of brand and, and customer satisfaction message, but those cost savings literally float right to the bottom line. Right. So those are some totally. quick, not quick wins, but some other areas to look for sure. So when you're making some of these changes, right, and you're like working with these restaurants, um, so say labor or food or beverage, um, you mentioned like that you can evaluate how it's going based on like things like customer satisfaction or maybe you're looking at order sizes or, you know, whatever. Um, how quickly are you looking at those metrics? Like, and I guess it probably varies depending on the metric, but 
Are there any like leading indicators in any of those three categories that you're looking at to determine if what you're changing is actually landing? Like if it's actually like, like driving a success, successful, um, like outcome fresh. Yeah. 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 I'd say like, um, you'd have to see a cycle, right? So maybe the first time that I would be able to look at that is like maybe a cycle of a week, right? Maybe a month and then a quarter because there's variation depending on the day of operation, right? So there's a certain amount of time that needs to be had um, in order to be able to kind of see impact, right? From a leading indicator perspective, you know, let's just take the placemat example. You, you look at orders, right? So like how many orders is your team making into this purveyor to source this product, right? That you need for operations, mm-hmm. right? So maybe one of the things you say, hey, we would order placemats, you know, twice a week, or we'd order, you know, a beverage twice a week or three times a week. In this upcoming week, are we actually ordering once, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, are we able to do that? Or is the order size from a cost perspective less than what it has been because we're printing on one side instead of two? Right. So from a a leading indicator perspective, as it relates to operational metrics, I I think your order size and your orders are maybe a way to see what the output or outcome is going to be Um, from from a macro trend perspective or just from an operational trend perspective. There's a ton of leading indicators, you know, that that you can track right either on the store level from, a you know, let's call it a reservation conversion ratio you know, whether it's a foot traffic metric that you're trying to track and how many people have been floating, you know, through your restaurant or around your restaurant. Um, there's a lot of those type of metrics, right, that you can track before you have that meeting with your accountant and understand kind of what your performance was, right? We always say that accountants just, you know, they, they document the past. So right. what you need to do is get ahead of the curve, right, and be able to make that past as rosy and as gold as it can be. Totally. Uh, I mean, even on, on the labor side, there are some obvious metrics like turnover and uh, staffing rate. Yeah, I think that before the pandemic, everybody kind of used PAR as a, at 120% staffing levels. Yep. And that was the expectation for you to be fully staffed because everyone knows that like typical industry turnover for hourly in the hospitality space is 150%. So yeah, maybe we're not staffing at 150, but we're staffing at 120 so that, you know, if we have that turnover, we're still fully able to to service the guests and still we're not needing to close off sections of the dining room. We're not mm-hmm. needing to turn off third party delivery because we just our back of house can't handle it. You know, those types of things. Um, honestly, all lost revenue opportunities also lost bottom line opportunities, because if you're paying the fixed cost of your rent, you're paying the f- fixed cost of um turning the lights on, uh, but you're not able to get more volume out of each box or each roof, right. then it's it's lost opportunity. So before COVID, it was looking like that. And then now what we're seeing is, um, I think that the hospitality industry through desperation had just decided to like make part 100%, which is like, I mean, it makes sense. Yes, par can be 100%. But if you have 150% turnover, then how can par be 100%? That means you're always going to be like, you know, right. at least 20, 30% understaffed. For sure. You know, I, I think that's that's all super important for operators to kind of keep in mind, right? Is that cutting on that par level, right? Ultimately could have systemic impact on just operations. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, so it's interesting, but, you know, of course, some of like the, a lot of our clients are, are, doing quite well. I mean, obviously, haha, because, uh, you know, we're able to help them with hiring. But um, I do see that we're moving in a direction where people are kind of reverting back to that level of service, obviously using technology to automate some things, like maybe you're automating your drive through, maybe you're automating, um, you know, how you're managing orders, like there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of improvements that can be done there. But um yeah, maybe that'll bring you back to like a par of 115, Yeah, uh, if anything, but certainly not like 100. So uh, it's interesting. We definitely are thinking a lot more about, you know, forward looking. How can we anticipate competition in labor? How can we anticipate not just within the industry, but also outside of it? Every, you know, we're going into peak retail season, for example. Right. Peak retail season is right about when every single retailer starts hiring seasonal workers, paying them more because they can, because it's like their blockbuster time of the year. And uh, meanwhile, what goes along with that? Well, all the logistic providers, 
all the drivers, all the mailmen, all the warehouse, uh, all the warehouse stockists, um, all those folks, Amazon, these types of companies start really like ramping things up. So how can you be prepared for that? So how do you think about like seasonality, actually? Like, I'd be curious, you know, how do you like bake seasonality into like some of like the risk management or planning that you play in? Yeah. Uh, so I think there's, there's, I'm going to try to connect the dots here. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, one of the things that you kind of said here, the discussion point around par levels and, and kind of labor, uh, labor levels, I think it's also really important to keep in mind the cost of onboarding, right? Meaning like training and getting people up to speed and up to par, being able to kind of hit stride and run the way they need to. And, and I think that's, again, another operational, um, you know, a, a, a variable cost, right? That you incur as a business. So the more turnover you have, right? And it's inherent in the industry, but the quicker you can get that person up to speed, right? And the less time you're spending on training, right? And the easier it is to onboard people in a, in a go forward cadence. So from an operational cost perspective, right? Getting your training and onboarding program to be really lean and efficient, right? Will ultimately save you labor hours in the long run as turnover is inherent in the industry. Right. So there's a certain amount of that. And I think a certain amount of that goes into the seasonality component as well. Right. It's saying that there are natural ebbs and flows in hospitality operations. And there's some months that are, you know, uh, bad in New York and other months that are bad in, let's call it Austin, Texas. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sure. Or San Francisco or, or wherever. So there's there's an inherent kind of need to be able to be agile. Right. To be able to plan for the future, to be able to kind of understand your business model and understand the seasons and cycles that your business goes through. And again, those efficiencies from an operations perspective really allows you to kind of flex when you need to, but then also downsize when, when you don't have to. Um, so seasonality is something that that's always there. You know, what we often do at Coresnick is, you know, we have a, an fp &A tool that we've developed. Um, and it's a, it's a financial planning and analysis tool where we'll build out models for our clients and they can kind of actually flex ratios. So during COVID, a lot of our, our clients really benefited from it. We said, okay, cool. This is our business model. Here are some key drivers of revenue. Here are some key drivers of costs. Let's say if we have to close down 50% of our dining room because of um, you know, restrictions as it relates to COVID, cool, I can click that down. What does that do to my metrics? Okay, cool. I need to downsize my 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 labor not by fifty percent, but by thirty percent. Right? That's kind of the threshold of keeping my metrics as honest and and performing at a high level. It's not a fifty to fifty match. So from totally. a season, yeah, so like from a seasonality perspective, or even from a planning perspective, right? Really understanding your metrics and your business, and being able to you know flex certain drivers of revenue and cost to see the impact on the bottom line gives you insights to make decisions as to how to prepare for the slow season or the busy season. I was going to say, like, how do you, like, um, deal with sort of, like, clients or businesses that are probably less, say, financially savvy or less savvy with, say, building models um, in a way that, I mean, this sounds actually kind of incredible, that fb &A tool. I mean, it sounds like an amazing kind of piece of kit you have. Like, how do you prepare types of clients to, like, not just see that data, but be able to go forth and actually use that data appropriately? Yeah, you know, I think the let's just level set here and base case is that, you know, we have to assume that all of these operators and all of these clients know their business, right? Yeah. So they're tracking their business. They know their business, right? They know last month we made, you know, X amount of dollars, right? Two months ago, we made 2X. They have to have an intuition or a gut as to kind of why that was the case, right? Um, was it higher revenue? Was it, you know, better, better cost management, et cetera? So if you don't have a formal kind of team to do FP&A, right, financial planning and analysis, the real idea here from a macro perspective is understanding your financial metrics, right, understanding what gives you good financial performance and being able to analyze that. So what we often say is, you know, you should be empowering your organization through, through data. So whatever that data is and however you can get it, right, keep track of it and monitor it, understand the trends in that data, Right. And then try to use that data to say, hey, this is saying my turnover was 100 percent. Right. Versus 150 percent. What impact that did it have in my business's bottom line? So, you know, we try to do that Cone Resnick, you know, with these proprietary models that we offer to our clients um, that they can use the model. And we have teams and analysts that can kind of flex that for you. But even when I was an operator myself. Um, it was more trying to say like, cool, I have to report to my investors and I just spoke to my accountant. That conversation sucked, 
right? How, how do I next month have, to have yeah. a stuffy conversation? Well, I have to become proficient in my, in my, in my model and in my financials. So I guess Alex's response to your question, if you're not as financially savvy or not as let's say, um, you know, advanced or fluent in that FP&A function, I think the first step is understanding your business and understanding the drivers of revenue and cost, trying to track those and trying to kind of see trend analysis as to this happened and what was the outcome, right? Or this didn't happen and what was the outcome? Those are kind of some of those basic steps. And I, and I would say that a lot of people really overlook how fundamentally important that is to business operations. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's like, 80 20 rule, even if you don't know any sure. of the nuances, you don't know the price of every ketchup package, right? You should know how much money you're bringing in. Like, that's probably the easiest number for people to, to, you know, just tap into their POS analytics and see that. But then, probably those cost drivers are the big ones. It's like, you know, labor, food, beverage, and then those fixed costs like rent, you know, et cetera. Those you should know. But just having like a simple, like, okay, these are 80% of my costs. There are other costs in there too, but as long as I'm able to focus on these, then um, I can improve the business. Yeah. And I'd also like maybe say this is I think inherently if you if you own an operation or you operate in, in the hospitality industry, you have to be competitive just because mm-hmm. it's such a gnarly industry at times. You know what I mean? Like you <laughs> have to have that like grit about you to be able to like say, hey, I want to wake up today and, you know, go try to make <laughs> everyone happy or I want to go into the market today. And even though like, you know, commodity prices went up exponentially or gas prices went up exponentially, I'm still willing to get out there and kind of fight for it, right? So for me, it's often kind of changing a culture in some ways, whether that's an individual operator or chief operating officer or even of a team, right? To take that competitive nature that they have for just operating in that industry, right? And take it to the financials, right? And say, cool, let's get competitive, right? If you want to be best at basketball, you got to like, you know, shoot a lot of hoops, right? So like, how do we inherently culturally build a a team here that wants to be fluent in financials and wants to track those metrics, right? Try to tap into that competitive nature and really get the team behind you in kind of achieving that kind of holistic goal. Yeah, absolutely. No, that makes a ton of sense to me. I mean, uh, it is an, it's an industry that is con- takes no prisoners for sure. I mean, in New York, it's so competitive. We see yeah. turnover um, to capture the guest atten- consumer attention because at the end of the day, you're servicing these guests. And um, yeah, these, these like what we're talking about here is like, okay, what are like the nuts and bolts of the business? But then if you can get the nuts and bolts of the business like handled, labor, food, um, all the other stuff, then you can really focus on differentiating yourself from a guest experience standpoint. For sure. You know, I, I think the story that I tell is that when I got my first hospitality job, right, at like, a, I guess, at a, at a high level, it was at Grand Mercy mm-hmm. Tavern in the city, and I was interviewing for a busboy role with a general manager. I don't know if that's a high-level job, but um, he said to me, why do you want to be in the industry? And I said, you know what? Like, if my job every day is to make people happy and I can give the gift of joy to people, no matter what they walk into this restaurant with that's on their shoulders – what an amazing job to have, right? That you pretty much every day try to make people happy and give them joy, right? So like, that's often my driver for being in industry. And I know there's a lot of people out there that have that same driver. And I think where the art is, is being able to say, hey, I got the math and the foundations of financials kind of like understood. Now I get to paint pictures, right? And kind of connect those dots and do that kind of art exercise of the qualitative around making people happy because I have my quant down pack. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot easier to do the qualitative and win there when you know you have your quantitative really kind of in order and kind of in place. Oh, yeah, for sure. I've I've taken that I've taken that approach of making people happy into my marriage lately. Um, (laughs) So uh, I don't know if I'm winning there or losing that enough. I've been if I would be fired. um, (laughs) You got you got the finances down. (laughs) You're like, but you got your quantitative down. Yeah, I got my down. Right, I paid my mortgage and all that, but the quantitative (laughs) I'm still still working on. You know, Um, amazing. I I I do think that that's actually like um, a really phenomenal kind of like almost like like ending sentiment, almost like that. Thinking about math as like the foundation for all of these organizations, I think, you know, like to your point, like you can eke, you can improve these sort of like cost of good souls or labor turn, you can get these kind of real hard metrics, like you can turn them around and then really make up the difference on the qualitative side with like your guest experience. I think like, honestly, that was almost like revelatory for me there. I was hearing you say that and I was like, 
light bulb, like, duh, obviously, you know? Um, Because the thing that came into my head was like castles built on sand. You know what I mean? Like if the numbers aren't there, the business is like keeping the lights on. The business is not going to be there if you don't have the financials in place in the first place, irrespective of how good you think the actual qualitative experience, customer experience is. And I think like, yeah, I just like feel like that was such a kind of like nice little kind of uh, way to kind of like sum up the whole your data pitch for the last 30 minutes. Because can you believe that we've just done 30 minutes? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, I suppose in that sense, because we've kind of come to the end of our episode, you know, our fast, casual 30 minutes, as we like to say. Uh, is there any like, kind of last kind of closing thoughts you have there, Steve? Uh, no, just, you know, thankful to be on here. Um, you know, happy to be talking about an industry that I'm super passionate about and have so much love for and, and so many uh, so many friends still operating in industry. Um, I guess for anybody out there in industry thinking about um, this podcast is like, hey, Keep it up. Keep fighting. You know, uh, there, there's uh, there's gold at the end of the rainbow. That's for sure. Right. But it's a kind of bumpy road to get there. So, um, you know, uh, just, uh, yeah, try to take something away from this and try to learn and try to make yourself better and your team better. And, uh, you know, it's um, it's an awesome industry to, to practice in for sure. All right, great stuff. Awesome. Vivian, any follow from yourself? Yeah, I mean, I echo everything that Stephen said. So thanks so much for the time today. Sure. Yeah, we got into a lot of nitty gritty and um, I'm, I knew this conversation would be informative and it certainly was. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks for having me. All right. Great stuff, guys. I'm just going to wrap it up here and say, like I always say, every restaurant has a story. You know, we're here to learn the playbooks that built the world's greatest restaurants and how you can apply them as a founder, owner, operator or investor yourself. Thank you all very much for listening and we will see you next Wednesday. Thank you. Bye bye.